Hello, and welcome to my video on how to run the code. So my first tip is to just point you to the documentation. Uh, we've done our best to explain how it works, but we certainly would be happy to receive feedback on it. So just to remind yourselves of where we were uh, from the previous video on how reflections work, you want to know where you think reflections will be useful. You want to isolate the rising and setting arcs in those regions. And we're going to find the frequency of the interference patterns, relate them to h, which is the reflector height. And then we're going to do it for every possible satellite. So what I left out of that theoretical discussion of reflections is data. So let's just talk about briefly what you need. I only allow RINEX 2.11 and RINEX 3. Those are the community standards. We certainly can expand that, but that is the current allowance. You have to have SNR data in your files, period. And you have to have receiver coordinates in the header because I need those data to compute elevation angle. So hopefully the code will tell you politely that you have tried to do the analysis without those. Um, but if not, that's something to check. So RINEX 2.11 has very simple station names. Uh, lowercase four character stations, day of year is a three character field and the, and, and the year goes at the end with a O for observation. If the files had a NACA compressed, uh, the O is replaced with a small d. RINEX three file names are really complicated. I couldn't even begin to describe them. And then I would suggest to practice with our highlighted use cases first and then try new data or try data that you've collected, but use, use the use cases to get an idea of how the code works first. And I also have a small video on, on the files and other types of GNSS lingo. So what's the software package doing? Uh, there are three main modules. RINEX SNR is the one that reads the RINEX files, computes the elevation and azimuth angles, and saves the SNR data. Quick Look is a, a, a visual feedback module that lets you work on an analysis strategy. And then GNSS IR is the workhorse that does the analysis for reflector heights after you've already saved the data and your analysis strategy. At the beginning, you should expect to sort of iterate on these things to make sure your analysis strategy is good. You might change your region. You might change your elevation angle mask, things like that. But eventually, you won't look at any data visually. You will translate the data, and then you will estimate reflector heights, and you can put your effort into making environmental products or doing science with the results. So the first step will be to be setting up some environment variables. Uh, one is where executables go for geodetic uh, support modules. Uh, reflection code there, the middle one, is the main one for my code. Orbits. Originally, I meant I separated orbits because you know people use orbits for positioning too, and there's no reason to have two sets of orbits on your computer. Uh, those can be directed to the same directory uh, if you wish, and you can store those in your .bashrc file. What's moving on? Rhinex SNR picks up the files, uh, which are again Rhinex. You can use your own files if you wish, or the code will download them. Uh, the code picks up the orbits for you, and the output, I'll just call that an SNR file, if you will. Now, the defaults are GPS only, and elevation angles less than 30 degrees. If you want more information, most of it's at GitHub, but you can also get a quick uh, overview on what's allowed in RINEX to SNR-H. The command line only requires the station name, the year, and the day of year. That's it. And this is going to be an example for site P041. Now, this is a visual, uh, this would be a visual summary of what a single satellite pass of data looks like. On the x axis, time, I've shown an SNR rising and setting arc here. The y axis is dB Hertz. And uh, this happens to be the L2C frequency. All of the data are shown in blue. 
The data below 30 degrees are outlined in red. Those are the ones that I think are useful and that will be kept. I just want to compare this with the model uh, predictions from the previous video where everything was nice and smooth. Here you can clearly see there is some noise on the observations. And these aren't perfect sinusoids. I mean, they're, they're actually reflecting off a real uh, soil surface. So part of our job will be to extract the frequencies from these data, knowing that there are noise on the data. The information that's stored in the file is the satellite number, the time of the observation, the elevation angle, the azimuth angle, and the actual SNR observation. So visually, if you throw out all the high elevation angle data, you get something that looks like this. In the top plot, again, we're plotting this as a function of time, so the rising arc on the left and the setting arc on the right. I've used different colors here because I wanted to make the plot below in terms of elevation angle. And if you do that, you won't be able to tell which one's the rising and setting, so the colors tell you that. Uh, here are the azimuth angles as a function of rising uh, and setting arcs in time. And uh, I, I, I outlined it in red here just so you could see it on the reflection point uh, map below. But just to point out, for one single satellite arc, you get two reflection tracks. One will be in the south and one will be in the northeast. All right. So again, there's 32 satellites rising and setting twice a day. You can get a lot of reflections just from GPS. And then, of course, once you add in GLONASS, Beidou, and Galileo, a huge number of uh, values. Now, quick look, the second module, again, is meant to help you set up an analysis strategy. It's going to just uh, categorize the data in terms of the quadrants northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, and so on. It's going to try to pick a rising and setting arc within those values. It's going to take the SNR data, compute a periodogram, and reflector height will be on the x-axis. And it has some defaults, which just get you started. And then you can change those on the command line. And we also return some quality control metrics. Now, I just want to point out there are going to be some failed retrievals here which are just going to reflect the point that certain of those arcs, you can see they rise and set, and they never get very high in the sky, especially some of those that only get to about 10 degree elevation angles. Now, that might be enough for certain locations, but certainly uh, it's a poor estimation of reflector height for most low uh, antennas, as this is a two meter case. So we want to throw those out. And then over here, you'll see some failed retrievals, not because, or there will be failed retrievals, not because the soil isn't planar, but because the arc starts on one quadrant and ends in another quadrant. And just because of the way we've parameterized the data, just to get a, and the, the code is called quick look after all, we've set that up so we can get a quick answer. And sometimes that means the, the data set gets split. And, We'll have it as a failed retrieval, but you could think about going back and reparameterizing that so those those data could be saved if you were interested in that. So for quality control, we use only two two kind of metrics. One is how big is the amplitude of the spectrum. So that's a pretty simple thing here. The peaks at about 1.9 meters here, and I've got the arrow pointing to it. The amplitude is about 17 or 18. And that means if you set your amplitude criteria to 10, that would clearly pass. If you set it to 15, it would clearly pass. But if you set it to 20, it wouldn't. Um, the second metric is just the peak here. Again, 18 divided by the average value over the entire noise region, which is here set to be from 0 to 6. And that typically, a value of 3 is pretty good. And that's probably what the default is. You can change that depending on what surface you're using, and it'll depend on what your uh, surface is. Why isn't there one special number for quality control? Well, different surfaces and elevation angle mass lead, lead to drastically different peak amplitudes. We have some receivers that have very strange, well, not very strange, they have different behaviors than you might expect. 
and and so that can be a little bit tricky to uh, code up. Peak to noise is a pretty simple metric. It works well, but it mixes it misses some complexity. So there's there's no prohibition from coming up with better quality control. But this is to get you started. I do recommend that the noise metric be computed in a consistent way appropriate for your surface. And I'll give you some examples of that. <clears throat> so the quick look code is meant to give you the feedback to let you set those quality control metrics. Here would be an example, the data are on the top. So those are SNR data with the direct signal contribution removed. If you computed a spectral peak, or excuse me, if you computed a periodogram using the entire time series, the amplitude would be smaller than if you use the orange region, which is over a smaller range, just because the amplitudes of the sinusoids in the orange region are larger. And this, in fact, is the case. If you see on the left, the 5 to 25 degrees peaks at about 15, where on the right, it peaks well over 20. All right. The periodograms are also wider uh, on the right. Why is that? Because less data were used, fewer data were used. That doesn't mean you can't use 5 to 15, but that is the difference between the two. The peak to noise ratio will vary depending on how big you make the noise region. So on the left, if you use from 0 to 6, you'd get something quite different than if you used a noise region from 0 to 20. So we typically use a noise region of 6 to 8 meters from zero. And it would depend if your value, if your reflector height's at 15, you don't want to use a noise ratio computed from 0 to 6 and so on. So let me give you two examples. <clears throat> One is a, a bare soil site in Boulder. And it's not completely flat, but it's fairly planar, especially in winter. Uh, this would be the default returns. You just give it the station name, the year, and the day of year. The antenna is about two meters tall. The successful retrievals in the four different quadrants are colored. Uh, but the unsuccessful ones are these light gray lines. And if you looked at them, you certainly wouldn't think they looked very good. And in fact, that's the case. And that's why they've been flagged as being no good. And then the next plot would give you a, a, a summary. So the top plot are the reflector heights, and you can see that they're all bunched around two meters for all azimuths, which is the x axis. But you can also see the peak to noise is defined at, for the good retrievals, which are blue, at about four to five. And the peak amplitudes for this L1 frequency are at about 10. I mean, it would it depends, but they're about you know eight to 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 12. If you uh, on the command line indicate you want L2C, which is frequency 20. In general, the retrievals are far better, I would say. The noise levels are lower. There's still some failed retrievals, but again, that's not the soil. That's just a manifestation of how we've split up the data. I just wanted to highlight those are in the western quadrants and the eastern quadrants, and, and they are because of the constellation and because of how we've defined the uh, quadrants. But again, those are very successful retrievals. If you wanted to look at the GLONASS data, you're going to have to remake your uh, SNR file because you previously used GPS orbits. But if you overwrite it and use GNSS, you'll get a, a GLONASS file. Here we're going to use GLONASS in the Quick Look uh, code. And all you have to do is specify frequency 101. Uh, which is my shorthand for GLONASS L1. I add 100 to indicate it's GLONASS. And these are beautiful retrievals. So uh, again, GNSS IR works for all the constellations. Similarly, you can change the, the frequency range on the command line. Here I've said go out to 20 meters instead of the default, which is 6. Now, a more complicated GPS GNSS site is in uh, Canada. We're going to do some lake reflections just to show you that you shouldn't always use the defaults. <clears throat> the defaults, again, are just the station name, the year, and the day of year. Uh, I would call this failed reflectometry. Lots and lots of gray means they're failed periodograms. There's a couple colored uh, values, but they're not. those are not values associated with the um, 
the water. And that's because the water is beyond six meters. It's at about 6.5 meters. So here's L1, but I've on the command line changed the heights to be restricted to two to eight meters. Now you get a very nice retrieval at about six and a half meters. The azimuth mask very clearly shows you where the water reflections are, which agree completely with the photograph that we started with or the Google Earth image. You do get retrievals if you use L2. These are the legacy L2 signals, but you see the problem. There are two peaks and that has nothing to do with reflectometry and everything to do with the way that particular receiver is generating the L2 signal. Uh, it's just a complication I prefer to avoid. I much prefer using L2C signals. And unfortunately, this agency doesn't track them at this site. So if you want good L2 data, the simplest thing you can do is track L2C. Uh, the goal is to use Quick Look to set up an analysis strategy so you can run GNSSIR, which was the last module. So it saves your analysis strategy in a JSON file. You are able to edit that by hand, but we do have a, a little script that will put the defaults in it. You need the latitude, longitude, and height, but they don't have to be very precise. They're only used for the refraction error. The screen output tells you where that goes. I've uh, done a, a, a sample here where, again, the defaults are everything between 0 0.5 to 6 meters. And here I'm using elevation angles 5 to 25. Uh, the noise region by default is the same as the reflector height region. Uh, the precision is set to 5 millimeters. Anything beyond that, I think you're just wasting your time. The default is to use all the quadrants 90 degree azimuth ranges and all GPS frequencies. I don't like the legacy L2, so the default is frequency 20. Uh, you can change that by hand if you prefer. And the amplitudes, this is just a generic six. I mean, you could set it to 10 or 15, whatever you think is best for your site. I do have a few command line uh, options. So if you only had L1 data, which is the case at the uh, lake site, if you did want to use all available GNSS signals, you can say all frequencies true. You can change the reflector height region. You can change the elevation angle masks. To change azimuth regions, you do have to do that by hand. Now you're ready to run the code. Uh, again, we've tried to make it as simple as possible. Station name, year, day of year. The code tells you where it got the SNR file and it tells you where the results are written out. Uh, this is a sample uh, example of what the values look like. Year, day of year, column reflector heights, column three, the satellite number, the UTC time. And then mostly the other values are just to help you uh, understand the, the, the values if you want to look at them uh, with any more uh, interest. But year, day of year, and reflector height are the main things you'll be using. Now, people ask me if you can change your strategy on the command line, and uh, yes, that defeats the purpose of having a strategy. I would, if you want to compare strategies, I would encourage you to use the extension flag. So for example, you could change, you could have two strategies, one where you use elevation angles 5 to 20, and the other one where you use 5 to 15. You make two JSONs, you can completely segregate the outputs and compare them that way. Uh, you can also save month and day to the output file that was requested by a user who wanted to compare to tide gauge data. You can also, on the command line, at the top here, analyze an entire year of data. On the second line, I show that you can do three years of data with just a single line. So it just tells you to go from one to the end of the year for three years. So how would you set things up for the more complicated case? Well, it's not that complicated. I mean, you put in the station name, the lat, long, and height. You restrict the heights, in this case, I put between three and eight meters. You could set that to two to eight. I've told it L1 is true because I'm not gonna use that L2 data, but I do set the azimuth values by hand. 
And so I, after that JSON is made, I do go in and, and this is an example of how I changed it. Uh, for slow moving surfaces like lakes and ice sheets, daily averages are sufficient. And I have a little tool called daily average, which takes the station name as the input and a median filter, which is to let you get rid of the gross outliers. And then it says, look, uh, how many tracks am I going to require per day to put out a, a, a daily average? Because you don't really want to make a daily average where only five values are available and compare it to another day when there are like 50. So those, those are just two values that I use that are kind of helpful to make sure you're not comparing things that are very different. Um, so one thing you can do is make the medium filter so large that the the outliers are obvious, and, and I, I did that on the lower left. No outliers have been removed, but you can see them, right? Now you can spend time trying to figure out what caused those outliers, and you can you know, work on your strategy so that those outliers never occur, or you can set a reasonable median filter value and get something like what you see on the right. So, I personally prefer to spend my time uh, doing the scientific products with quality control metrics that work. And um, I'm, I'm using that code for that purpose here. So this is when I've set it to 25 centimeters and 15 values needed to make a daily average. And you can see that you get a perfectly valid retrieval uh, at this particular site, uh, the Canadians run a tide gauge, and the correlation between the GPS reflection tide, tide gauge values and the, uh, quote, real tide gauge is 0.994. So uh, that's a very, very, very good correlation. So the advanced topics not covered yet, but will be uh, talked about on October 21st or how to do tides. For that, we're not going to use daily averages. We're going to do sub-daily estimates and model those. Uh, taller GNSS sites for reflectometry, we're not going to be able to use these 30-second geodetic sampling rates. And we'll talk about how to use those sites optimally. Are some receivers better than others? Absolutely. But I'm not going to post those online. I'll talk to you about it and about why some are better than others. Again, is there a Nyquist? Absolutely. Uh, read our paper here. It's posted on my website. Outliers. I showed you there were some outliers in the Canadian data set. Uh, the GPS sites on a pier. It's entirely possible that boats are you know, setting up next to your site. So you can worry about that a lot, or you can possibly, like I've shown you, use a, a median filter to remove those. But also keep in mind, perhaps it means you didn't set a conservative elevation and azimuth angle. So those are two things to keep in mind. And again, if you're struggling with your data set and picking the right analysis strategy, uh, I encourage you to look at the use cases because we've tried to make those um, representative of what you can find in the geodetic uh, archives. Thanks very much.